My guest today is Professor Daniel McKinsey, who's Professor of Physics at the University of California, Berkeley. His research focuses on direct searches for dark matter interactions, and he serves as co -sp uh, spokesperson of the LUX experiment. He also collaborates on the LZ experiment and is doing R&D on superfluid helium for low mass dark matter detection. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you, great to be here, my pleasure. Yeah, so dark matter has been in the news um, uh, a lot lately, um, uh, but I, it doesn't look like we have moved a lot in the last uh, few uh, decades, right? Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, is it true to assume that we have a fair confidence that there is something out there? Um, uh, there, there were some alternative theories like uh, modified Newtonian mechanics and so on. Are we reasonably confident there's something out there? Yeah, in fact, I would say that most of the movement uh, has been in the astrophysical side, more and more evidence for dark matter as particle-like nature. Um, there's, you know, certainly over the last three decades and and the progress continues in understanding dark matter's gravitational properties and evidence for its uh, gravitational interactions from a variety of sources and quantifying the amount of dark matter. Um, there's been you know, really consistent progress on that front and uh, qualitative improvements in understanding dark matter on that front as well. Yeah, so I, I was thinking sort of pessimistically, <laughs> Daniel, you can correct me. So the, the only thing we can sort of say is that we see the gravitational effects of dark matter. It, it's not small, it's 85% of all the matter we, we think uh, that's out there. Right. We only see gravitational effects. Is it possible that there is no other effect for dark matter? It's only well, it's possible. I mean, it's certainly possible. Um, you know, it's possible that even if ordinary matter and dark matter were produced together in the early universe, it could be that its interaction with ordinary matter is just too small to really ever be observed. That's possible. Um, I hope that's not true because then <laughs> we won't be able to understand its interactions if we can't measure them. Yeah. But there's a good shot at um, possibility that dark matter interacts in a measurable way with ordinary matter, with electrons and protons and neutrons, uh, the stuff that make up us and the world we're used to interacting with. Um, so there and there are you know, a variety of theoretical mechanisms by which dark matter could interact with, with ordinary matter. And so we're mostly you know trying to discover exactly how what's dark matter particles nature, that is, what's its mass of that particle, and how does it interact? And of course, it's also possible there could be multiple kinds of dark matter. Um, so when I talk about how it interacts, it's a little bit shorthand for how dark matter particles could interact, but, and it's certainly possible there's only one kind of dark matter remaining. Um, I mean, in a way, you could say that neutrinos are one of the kinds of dark matter out there but the total mass of the neutrinos we believe is too small, at least the standard kinds of neutrinos we know about to make up the dark matter. Yeah. But we already have this kind of evidence for the neutrino, several kinds of neutrinos, which are you know, a stable form of extremely weakly interacting particles that sort of form a model for what dark matter could be like, though the number of ways dark matter can interact is, is larger than, than that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an amazing uh, question. It's an amazing research area. So I, I want to sort of lay out the spectrum um, of dark matter possibilities. Um, so so we could measure that by expected mass or energy or whatever, right? So yeah, this is one of those things where it could be pretty much in anything. I mean, uh, it could be electron mass, it could be proton mass, it could be hydrogen <laughs> atom mass. Or it could be it something could be so light that the wavelength of the dark matter is about the same scale as the size of the galaxy. Extremely wow. light dark matter particles. Or, you know, they could be extremely heavy. I mean, there's still room. There could be some black holes out there. <laughs> uh, primordial black holes could still be the dark matter to some degree. Uh, really, all the range, entire range up in the mass 
really the first thing you can ask is what is the dark matter particle's mass? That's maybe the first question on the spectrum. And it's really a huge possible range of masses. Um, like 20, 20 orders of magnitude, stretching 20 orders of magnitude or more, right? More than that. Uh, off the top of my head, it might be more than 40. <laughs> really a huge range. Um, I, don't, I don't remember exactly, but it's really quite a huge range of um, possible dark matter masses. Uh, historically, you know, we've mostly been focusing on the WIMP, uh, the weakly interacting massive particle. That's the idea that the dark matter could interact in the same way that the neutrino does through the weak interaction. You know, there, in, in physics, you talk about four different forces, electromagnetism, the weak force, the strong force, and gravity. So when physicists say weak, it's a technical term. It means interacting through exchange of W and Z and Higgs bosons. Um, so when we say a weakly interacting particle, basically we're saying a particle that interacts in a certain way like a neutrino does, or in a similar way. Um, and for many decades and continuing, the WIMP has been one of the preferred dark matter candidates. Ideas that a dark matter candidate could have a mass between a few times that of a proton to 100,000 times that of a proton, roughly. And that's a very uh, nice range. It uses an interaction that we know a lot about, the weak interaction. And it's a dark matter mass that actually gives you, of order, you know, the right abundance of dark matter in the early universe. Um, in much of the way that light elements are produced in the early universe, you get a freeze-out mechanism where the dark matter could be reproduced and still be around us today. Uh, so historically, the last 30 years, the WIMP has been a really preferred candidate for the dark matter, along with another particle called the axion, uh, which is much lighter. And so for the past, I guess, 20 years or so, I've been working on WIMP searches, largely using liquefied noble gases, uh, like liquid xenon. Um, and so the Lux experiment that you mentioned earlier is it was a, about a 200 kilogram uh, vessel of liquid xenon. That is 200 kilograms of liquid xenon. And we use that to search for uh, these very, very rare interactions of dark matter particles. Um, is, there, is there some sort of experimental bias there, Daniel? It's sort of a loaded question. So it's a bit like, you know, the person saying, I'm looking for my car key under the street light because that's where light is. Are, are, are WIMPs a little bit easier experimentally to try to find? Well, they were, but I, I think it's it was really more of a theoretical bias, frankly. Um, certainly the experiments were driven by the theoretical idea of the WIMP, that it was a relatively simple uh, dark matter candidate interacting in a way that we already know about the weak interaction, um, and just adding a new particle, basically. So it's not actually too much of a stretch, okay? So I would push back a little bit on that. I think it was really more theoretically motivated and that drove the experiments. In fact, um, a lot of the, for most of my career in this field, um, there's been a sort of figure of merit on the nucleus, which is A squared, the, the mass of the nucleus squared. The idea that the, you get an enhancement of the cross section of dark matter with ordinary matter that goes as A squared. And uh, that largely drove the wish to use heavier targets, like, for example, germanium or xenon, uh, relatively heavy isotopes to, uh, to do the dark matter searches. Uh, and that was not by accident. It was driven by the theoretical idea that the dark matter should have this mass, you know, in the hundred to a thousand times the mass of a proton kind of range. Um, so I think it was, of course, you don't do experiments that they're not going to work. You know, you have to do, you're right that you, in that sense of, you know, looking for your car keys under the lamppost. Yes, of course. If the lamppost is all you have to search for, you're going to look under a lamppost. <laughs> but I wouldn't oversell that. I mean, we, it was really a theoretically driven enterprise. You know, some, some theories that are, are very and still are very 
compelling used to justify experiments that are a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of time, uh, and um, you, know, you know, these are experiments that take of order 10 to a few hundred people to do. So it's not a small enterprise. Years of, of a lot of effort in these people to make these experiments work. It could also be a combination of things, right? We don't know. So it, it could be a spectrum of different particles making up the total mass that we expect to see out there. It's quite possible. Uh, so, so I want to go into this research, uh, the review article that you sent me. So there are three different priority research directions here. Um, and I know that you are intimately involved with detecting individual galactic dark matter particles below the proton mass mm -hmm. through interactions that advanced ultrasensitive detectors. So, so below the proton mass, um, that is still in the WIMP arena, right? It's not actually WIMPs. Oh, it's not. It's lower mass than WIMPs. So WIMPs, um, turns out that, that uh, the weakly interacting part of that only works down to, of order, the, the proton mass. Um, below that, below that mass, you need some new kinds of interactions. So you need a new kind of interaction and you need a new kind of dark matter particle. So in a way, it's a little bit more complex than the WIMP was. Yeah. But uh, there's lots of theoretical ideas, especially in the last decade or so, about um, you know plausible models for what the, the dark matter could be, where it's a lower mass than the WIMP. And so now we're looking a lot at sort of the KEV, 1,000 EV, to GEV, billion EV uh, range. So a factor of 1,000 or so uh, in mass sorry, a factor of a million <laughs> lower in mass than we've been looking, um, than the range we've been looking at so far. So a thousand to a billion, 10 to the six, or you know, six orders of magnitude lower in mass than we have with the uh, standard WIMP searches. However, it's a still a similar paradigm um, in many cases, you know, looking for individual particles scattering in a detector or, um, or producing individual particles in the particle accelerator. So event by event um, studies. Um, now in this sort of that mass range of KEV to GEV, again, um, the GEV is about a proton mass. So it's about a proton mass and a factor of a million or so below that. Um, in that range, we're still looking for individual interactions. If you go down to lower masses, um, those driven by axion or there are many other kinds of particles, dark photons that can exist at much lower masses. There your uh, mass is low enough that given what we know about the density of the dark matter, you likely have many particles overlapping in space, the, wave, uh, the waves overlapping, and you get multiple particles per mode. And so that's when we start talking about wave-like dark matter as opposed to particle-like. I mean, it's a, of course, in quantum mechanics, we know that waves are particles and particles are waves, you know, but uh, we can talk about things acting in a more particle-like way or a more wave-like way. And um, so for the lower masses, you know, so EV and below, we talk about wave-like dark matter and the experimental techniques to detect uh, very low mass dark matter like that are different and the techniques we use at higher mass dark matter to detect them as individual particles. So, so I don't know much about this, Daniel. Uh, are we still banking on the dark matter having some sort of electromagnetic interaction, or are we banking on the fact that it could occasionally hit the, the nucleus? Uh, so what are we, what are we, what is our assumption here that we will find something? What, what is well, it has to interact somehow with ordinary matter. It doesn't have to be through electromagnetism. Um, so some experiments um, assume some electromagnetic interaction, especially for the axion or the dark photon, um, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, there can be other kinds of interactions as well, like the weak interaction or mentioned, sort of, or some some connection or or um, how to say, often we talk in physics about a virtual interaction where there's some 
intermediate state at very high mass. And you get a, a connection of a couple different uh, virtual particles in order to make an interaction. And those could be new kinds of virtual particles to, to create the interaction. That is, there could be new kinds of interactions just beyond the strong, weak electromagnetic and gravity um, that dark matter feels. Um, and that's you know, quite possible. So from a cosmological perspective, um, this is something that created, that was created the Big Bang, right? It's not something that showed up later. Right, all the evidence looks like it was created in the Big Bang. Um, you know, we can see, if you look at the cosmic microwave background, this speckled pattern in the microwave left over from 400,000 years after the Big Bang. If you look at the power spectrum of that, if you do the Fourier transform of that uh, cosmic microwave background, you see the ratio of the peaks gives you a very strong evidence for dark matter and the amount of dark matter in the universe. Um, you know, the universe is sort of ringing like a bell at that early time, and that's just when the, the uh, recombination happens, electrons bind into atoms, and the light can stream out at that point. And so you have this image of the universe at that time, and the speckle pattern and its uh, Fourier decomposition tells you how much the universe is pulled together, contracted, versus how much it bounces back. You know, it bounces back from electromagnetic interactions. It's compressed from gravity. So you can get a, um, a really good handle on these cosmological parameters, including the amount of dark matter from the cosmic microwave background. And the incredibly precise recent measurements of the cosmic microwave background you know, are part of their compelling arguments for, for dark matter. Along with, I mean, to me, What's uh, especially striking are these examples where you have galaxy clusters going through each other and actually cases where um, using uh, lensing effects on light, you can map out where the gravitational stuff is in these galaxy clusters. And sometimes the amount of the actual ordinary matter is largely physically, spatially separated from most of the gravitational stuff. There's this famous example called the bullet cluster, but there are many such examples out there uh, where the dark matter is actually spatially separated largely from the ordinary matter. It's very striking. So those images are you know, very compelling. That's, you know, that's another one of the main uh, innovations in recent years about uh, providing more and more evidence for dark matter. Another interesting one recently was uh, you know, the LIGO detection of gravity waves from neutron stars and the detection of light at the same time, or a few seconds apart. The fact that you could detect an event in gravity waves and in light just seconds apart also put a very strong constraint on, uh, on theories these, uh, that didn't involve a dark matter particle. So. so, so this ratio, approximately one to six visible to dark matter, that has been fairly constant right from the beginning. No, that's changing over time. That changes over time. The rate, the amount of dark matter versus the amount of dark energy is changing versus time. Um, so we're actually, you know, where we are at about 14 billion years after the Big Bang, it's actually, in the history of the universe, it's actually, uh, in a way, a bit of a unique time with the amount of dark ma matter and the amount of dark energy, are, you know, roughly <laughs> about the same, you know, within an order of magnitude. So, um, since the stuff is everywhere, Daniel, um, this should be accreting into black holes also, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so is there is there anything that indicates, you know, sort of when I guess we can compute the mass of a black hole and we can sort of see the neighborhood and expect how much visible matter could, matter could have accreted into it. Is there anything that tells us how much dark matter accreted into, let's say, the Milky Way's uh, supermassive black hole? Hmm, I'm not sure. I mean, you can, I'm sure there are simulations run to that inform this, and I don't, I don't remember offhand how much of the central black hole is dark matter versus ordinary matter. But the thing about dark matter, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it, because it interacts so much less, it's hard for it to release energy and collapse to a smaller radius. So the dark matter, 
halo goes out to much larger distances than the ordinary matter on average. So I forget, I, I don't know what that means for the central black hole, but you can imagine that there's probably more ordinary matter that went into it compared to dark matter, compared to the galaxy as a whole, but I don't know the numbers. Uh, so, so I want to talk a bit about the technology that um, that you're working on and have worked on. So, um, the submass uh, proton uh, detection, direct detection. I know there's something at Stanford, right? Uh, there's an experiment uh, being constructed or running uh, at Stanford. Yes. So, um, so over the past 20 years or so, uh, I've been working on liquid xenon detectors for dark matter. Uh, and that has been very successful. We haven't actually detected dark matter particles. But on the other hand, we've been able to test a lot of possible dark matter parameter space down to much lower cross sections. And the experiments have worked. Um, and the basic approach there is that you have a tank of liquid xenon and you place an electric field in the liquid xenon. As you know, an electric field pulls charges through it, right? it accelerates charges. So if a particle scatters in the liquid xenon, that is, it could scatter from a xenon nucleus or it could scatter from an electron, uh, then you get a track. You get a xenon atom recoiling through the liquid and ionizing other xenon atoms, or you get an electron recoiling and making a track in the liquid xenon, ionizing other xenon atoms also exciting xenon atoms. So then you end up with some excited xenon atoms and some electrons. The ions are pretty much stationary and don't do much after that. But then you have two signals. You have a prompt scintillation light signal that comes from those excited atoms as well as any ions and electrons that happen to recombine quickly. But then you also have electrons extracted from that track. We're talking, you know, nanometer or micron scale tracks, uh, very small tracks in liquid xenon, too small to see by eye, say, um, but you can still extract charge from them. And then it turns out liquid xenon, uh, when it's very, very, very pure, uh, can allow electrons to be drifted through the liquid. And those electrons move at sort of micros, you know, millimeter per microsecond sorts of velocities. And the trick we use in these xenon detectors is we actually extract the electrons into gaseous xenon. So it started in the liquid, the high mass liquid, and then we extract the electrons into gaseous xenon. And in the gaseous xenon, the distance between xenon atoms is large enough that the electrons can get enough acceleration from the electric field if they get enough energy, they can actually ionize other xenon atoms from the electrons. And then the, the xenon in the gas makes more light. And so we see a flash of light in the xenon gas that's due to the electrons that are extracted from the track. So remember, we saw that prompt flash of light. Now we get another flash of light due to the electrons. And the time between those two flashes of light the first signal and the second signal, the time between those tells you how long the electrons drifted through the liquid xenon. And that tells you the Z coordinate, we call it, the depth of the event in the liquid xenon. And that gives us one coordinate of where the event happened, where that scattered, where that track was. Now that charge that got subtracted into the gaseous xenon makes this, again, the second flash of light you can imagine that second flash of light is kind of near the top of the detector. And we have, a, we have an array of photon detectors called photomultiplier tubes up in that gaseous xenon. You can imagine that the photomultiplier tubes that are near that second flash of light see more light. They detect more light. And the photomultiplier tubes that are further away in XY from the event see less light. And so we can generalize that and figure out the XY position of a given scattering event using the light distribution in the upper photomultiplier array. So for every scatter in the liquid xenon, we figure out its XYZ position in the xenon. 
and this is key. This is really key because we can then define a region in the central part of the liquid xenon. Imagine the central part of liquid xenon as well as an outer part of the liquid xenon. That central part we call the fiducial body. Okay. And in that central part of the liquid xenon, the radioactive background, backgrounds from neutrons and gamma rays are less than in the outer part. And so by having this extremely pure, clean liquid xenon, in which we define a central, especially clean, low background region, we can very greatly reduce the backgrounds. Another key point is that most backgrounds, like from neutrons or gamma rays, will cause multiple scatters in the liquid xenon. The distance that a gamma ray will go in liquid xenon is about, you know, or order of 10 centimeters. And similarly for a neutron. And so if our tank is big compared to 10 centimeters or so, then those neutrons and gamma rays are very likely to scatter multiple times. And then you're very likely to see more than one charge cloud coming out of the event. And so if we see multiple second flashes of light, um, then we know that that's a background event. So this combination of uh, very clean liquid with really good position reconstruction and short interaction lengths for the backgrounds has allowed us to have extremely low background liquid xenon detectors that we can use to look for dark matter interactions. And so that's been very successful um, with not just Lux, but uh, there's an experiment called Xenon that's had multiple iterations, an experiment called Panda X in China that had multiple generations, all basically using a similar technique, uh, very pure liquid xenon, photomultiplier tubes, a very low radioactivity tank, and located a mile or more <laughs> you know, underground uh, to get rid of cosmic uh, background from um, basically you know, cosmic rays that smash into the upper atmosphere, um, can cause a lot of radioactivity, go deep underground to get away from that, as well as to get away from muons, which are also produced in the upper atmosphere. So this is really mind-boggling, Daniel. I, obviously, I don't understand it all, but uh, the, the first thing is electron being a particle. Um, electron is also a wave-like phenomenon, so something hitting that is a particle in itself is a is a is a phenomenon in itself. So if I if I understand this correctly, are we are we saying that you can look at the patterns of the post impact scenario, and those patterns will tell you you can exclude anything that we know um, as you know from the from the particles that we know, cosmic rays or radiation, anything that we know uh, exists those patterns will tell us sort of a, it's like a fingerprint mm -hmm. of something. And if you exclude all of that, mm -hmm. and if you find a pattern that you can explain, then uh, then perhaps we can conclude as it's uh, it's a dark matter. Body. Right, so the dark matter events uh, in the WIMP hypothesis would be nuclear recoils, a xenon nucleus getting whacked by a dark matter particle, like a, you know, a game of billiards. Um, um, that xenon nucleus getting whacked. Most of the backgrounds, it turns out, are actually electron recoils. Gamma rays that tend to scatter from electrons. Nuclei that beta decay will make energetic electrons. So most of our backgrounds are electron work. Um, but we can tell the difference on an event-by-event -event basis between nuclear recoils and electron recoils. And we can in liquid xenon. One of the things I didn't mention early on is that the ratio of charge to initial light is different for nuclear recoils than for electronic recoils. So most of the backgrounds will produce a larger ratio of the second pulse to the first pulse compared to the dark matter particles and neutrons, which we can count a bit. So that's yet another tool we have in the liquid xenon to reduce backgrounds. Um, I should though mention that a huge amount of effort does have to go into making sure that uh, materials with which you construct the detector are very, very low in background, um, including uh, one of the nastiest backgrounds we have to deal with is radon. You hear about radon in the basement, yeah. this is a rare gas. 
um, radon decays, and it also has many daughters. You know, radon decays to particle A, which decays to particle B, which decays to particle C, and so on. Those are called radon daughters. And those can all also create backgrounds. And we have to worry quite a bit about radon in our xenon. Another turn, turns out that krypton we have to worry about quite a bit. Krypton, um, you know, I think of xenon as you know, this magic liquid uh, to do dark matter searches. Unfortunately, the next lighter noble gas is krypton, and krypton by comparison is very radioactive. <laughs> Um, krypton is produced in nuclear testing, um, uh, krypton-85, it's also produced in the upper atmosphere, krypton-81, and these radioactive krypton isotopes can cause a huge background for us. So we actually have to remove the krypton from the xenon to sub parts per trillion uh, in order to have low enough background on our experiments, and that's done by distillation or by putting the xenon through charcoal columns. Uh, the krypton will go faster through a charcoal column than xenon will. And so you can use that technique to remove the krypton. So, so it looks like radon and krypton are the evil noble gases. Um, xenon is our stable friend with no long-lived radioactive isotopes of its own. Uh, so argon is another story. It's slightly radioactive, but there are ways to reduce its radioactivity. And then neon and helium are intrinsically non-radioactive themselves. So you can think about building detectors with neon or helium as well for dark matter. So, so we have had multiple uh, experiments or multiple um, facilities looking for this, right? So we have one in South Dakota. Right. Yeah, there's one in Stanford. Um, is, is there a new one being designed? Um, more. So I mentioned the Lux experiment using the tank of liquid xenon. Uh, we're actually right in the middle of commissioning a new experiment called Lux Zeppelin. Zeppelin was another two-phase xenon experiment that was operated, built and operated in the United Kingdom. Um, we've you know, merged the Lux and Zeppelin in collaborations, and now we have a new experiment called Lux Zeppelin, um, which includes 10 tons of liquid xenon inside a high-purity titanium cryostat. Um, and ex all extremely low radioactive backgrounds. And that currently is built, it's being commissioned uh, in the Sanford Underground Research Facility in Lead, South Dakota. Uh, that's a, you know, inside a, a famous gold mine that's been turned into a research facility to do physics and other kinds of science as well. So we're very excited because uh, Lux Zeppelin will have about 50 times the sensitivity of Lux. Uh, and that just, you know, largely it's lower backgrounds, you know, better control of radioactive materials, but also just because it's bigger. Remember I mentioned that the radioactive backgrounds, they have to penetrate into that central volume, scatter, and then leave in order to cause a background. Well, the chance of that happening goes drops exponentially you know, as the size of the detector grows. So just the mere fact of making it bigger makes the background go down. Um, and so we're taking advantage of that. Um, with these big tanks of liquid xenon. Now, there will likely be another generation after Lux Zeppelin. We're starting to talk about uh, collaborating with the, the xenon uh, folks, the xenon collaboration, building a new, even bigger detector, maybe 50 to 100 ton scale, uh, really probe you know, even lower in dark matter cross section. Um, you know, after that experiment, there's going to be really severe. If we don't see dark matter from that, then we're going to have backgrounds from neutrinos, actually neutrinos from the upper atmosphere that will become a limiting background. Neutrinos can scatter from xenon nuclei, and we can't shield out the neutrinos. Um, so it becomes a, we call it a neutrino fog, which makes it harder to see the dark matter particles. But you know, if there's still, still lots of, uh, well-motivated parameter space, especially uh, involved if the dark matter interacts with ordinary matter by exchanging, by interacting by exchanging the Higgs boson. Remember this newly discovered uh, particle discovered at the Large Hadron Collider. The Higgs boson, it's possible that dark matter interacts through with ordinary matter by exchanging a Higgs boson. And there are a number of theories like that, that uh, Lux Zeppelin and its successor 
uh, will be able to probe it. So, yeah, I was wondering uh, if you get a hit in one of those experiments, experiments, uh, replication is going to be a tough thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I don't know. I mean, these, you know, nice thing is right now we've got three of these different collaborations. Um, as I mentioned, Lux Zeppelin, Xenon, Panda X. You know, if one of those experiments starts seeing something that might be the dark matter, it can be tested with another one. Uh, not, it won't take that long to test, actually. You know, if once you, once you know what you should might be looking for, you can focus more attention and resources onto that possible signal. And so it's actually an advantage that we, in this case that we have multiple collaborations. If we see a signal, it will be pretty quick to test, be tested by the other collaborations. I mean years, not decades. Okay. It's, a, it's a big difference. Um, without knowing much about this, Daniel, the focus here is sort of finding a particle uh, that sort of, you know, makes a standard model work, so to speak. But, but it's actually uh, a, it would be a particle beyond the standard model. Beyond the standard model. It would be beyond but, the standard model. And that's a key point. I mean, there, there are not that many pieces of evidence in physics for physics beyond the standard model. But crucially, we do. We absolutely do have evidence for physics beyond the standard model. We know that there's new particle physics to be found. One of them is the existence of dark matter. And Another is the matter antimatter asymmetry of the universe, another huge mystery uh, that needs new physics beyond the standard model to explain it. But, and I, I'd like to emphasize at this, this point, which is that the fact that we know that dark matter exists is an important clue to discovering new principles by which the universe works. Okay. In a way, the, fact, the existence of dark matter is a, is a clue to figuring out new principles, new ways that particles can interact, where do these particles' masses come from. Uh, we're always looking for new clues to make progress in particle physics. And the fact that we have clear evidence for new physics beyond the standard model in dark matter gives us some hope that if we can detect the dark matter interactions, measuring those interactions, as well as measuring the dark matter particle mass will give us a new new insights into expanding our known understanding of particle physics. So it's this important clue, and we don't have many clues actually for figuring out new particle physics, but that's a crucial one of them. Yeah. So so when you go down in the in the mass spectrum there, further and further down, lower and lower masses, mm -hmm. uh, at some point you have things like wave like phenomenon, right? Not particles. Mm -hmm. So so you have another research goal here. Um, so detect, de detect galactic dark matter waves using advanced ultrasensitive detectors mm -hmm. with emphasis on strongly motivated QCD axions. So axions have been postulated uh, as a possible dark matter phenomenon. Could you talk a bit about what that is? Yeah, so the axion is another you know, very well-motivated dark matter candidate. Um, there's a certain parameter in the standard model in the strong interaction, which is extremely small. It's a dimensionless parameter, which is of order 10 to the minus 10 or less if it's finite. But it turns out that if you invent a new particle called the axion, then it effectively produces that parameter to be zero, or the, the, it turns that parameter into a field and relaxes that field to zero, and then um, you can solve the so-called strong CP problem. So that existence of the axion um, is strongly motivated, uh, whether or not it's dark matter. So there's this independent argument for why the axion should exist. But if the axion exists, it's also a very natural candidate to be the dark matter particle. The axion would be very light, you know, a millionth of an EV or, or of order or, you know, several orders of magnitude higher than that or you know, 10 or 20 orders of magnitude less than that, certainly 10 orders of magnitude less than that, a huge range of possible uh, masses for the axion. Um, and there are a number of techniques for looking for axions, which include using resonant cavities or resonant circuits or sort of NMR-like techniques uh, in a polarized liquid um, or gravity wave effects, it turns out. 
So there's a whole range of experiments are looking for these sort of wave-like effects for ultralight dark matter. Um, at the same time, there are new experiments being proposed and built to look for particles in this KeV to GeV range I mentioned before. So a millionth the mass of the proton up to the mass of the proton. And we can still look for individual particle interactions there. It could be the dark matter particle scatters from a nucleus, like we said for xenon. It could be the dark matter particle scatters with an electron, for example. Or also there's a really a new industry of thinking that maybe a dark matter particle uh, has a wavelength large enough that's larger than the distances between individual atoms, and it can actually scatter and produce a phonon and interacting with a whole lot of nuclei at the same time uh, produce uh, uh, you know, a quantized uh, sound or heat particle, basically. And uh, so there's all sorts of studies now, theoretical studies of different materials uh, that could be useful for dark matter detection. Um, and that's a quite new, interesting area that's developing right now, thinking about different ways that the dark matter can interact with ordinary matter if it is much lighter than the limp. Um, if axions existed, Daniel, uh, would that be physically detectable? Is yeah. that possible? Absolutely, yeah. So the experiments I mentioned using resonant cavities or resonant circuits or others, yeah, the idea is to detect uh, the axions. That, 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 those, those experiments are running and designed and built for detecting axions. Um, now, it turns out that the, you know, once you know the axion mass, you also know its frequency, you could detect it actually very quickly. And the challenge is in spanning a huge range of masses efficiently to find it. Um, it would be quite spectacular if we figure out what the axion mass is. Uh, it'll be a pretty straightforward experiment. You might even be able to do it, you know, in your college, you know, you know do it in your <laughs> in your backyard, in your garage, and be able to detect the axon. Once we know what its mass is, it'll be relatively straightforward to detect. Um, the challenge is in, is in figuring out what its mass is in the first place. So, um... You know, string theory um, postulates, you know, multiple dimensions, um, seven or so uh, other spatial dimensions that we cannot really, really see. Uh, could this interactions be or could this effects be something emanating from hidden dimensions? Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, you know, the WIMPs that I mentioned earlier, there are many candidates for the WIMP that are uh, based on uh, extra dimension uh, motivated particles, but possible. Um, I can also say you know, string theory all has supersymmetry involved, and supersymmetry uh, was one of the you know, theoretical motivations for the WIMP, it still is. Um, so there's a connection to string theory, uh, certainly, if we can, um, you know, helps, you know, motivate the uh, searches we're doing for the dark matter. Uh, and you can go much, much higher than proton mass. Um, uh, Tom, uh, your colleague, I think mentioned it could be as big as a hydrogen atom, <laughs> some possible dark matter particle. Uh, uh, the possible? particle could be much, much larger, larger wavelength than a hydrogen atom. It could be the size of the galaxy. In fact. <laughs> uh, there's a huge possible range of wavelengths and therefore masses uh, wow. of the dark matter particle. Um, but, you know, for these uh, you know, sub-GEV, sub-proton mass dark matter particles, there's a lot of new technology development uh, to detect these low masses. The challenge is, you know, if your, your, your dark matter particle is much lighter than the nucleus that you're trying to get it to scatter with, it just doesn't deposit much energy. It's like a ping pong ball hitting a bowling ball. You know, it just gives it a little nudge, okay? so. You have to detect much, much lower energy deposits uh, in your detector. And so that energy threshold, that is the energy above which you can detect individual events, is a critical parameter for these new dark matter searches. And many of them involve detecting single electrons uh, or in, order, in your detector, instead of a cloud of electrons, say like we detect with the xenon detectors, you might really be trying to detect one or two or three electrons 
very small number of electrons in these new, new experiments. Or you know, maybe your energy is so low, below chemical energies, below the energies that which you can ionize atoms. Might be that you're going to solo, so such a low energy that all you can produce is heat phonons in your experiment, and you'd have to somehow use the information about the heat produced in order to understand is what you're looking at a signal from a dark matter particle, or is it some kind of background? Uh, again, backgrounds are a huge challenge, reducing backgrounds from ordinary stuff, something going bump, some crystal shifting, some something vibrating in your experiment, producing a little bit of heat that you could think maybe that was a dark matter particle. You have to suppress all these kinds of backgrounds in order to be able to search for the dark matter. And that becomes more and more of a challenge. Now, instead of, instead of backgrounds at gamma ray energy scales or extra energy scales, uh, KEV to MEV energies. Now we're pushing into a regime where it's uh, backgrounds of chemical energy scales, EV ranges. And so it's a whole new world of background suppression that we're now dealing with with these new experiments. Um, and so there's a lot of you know condensed matter insights, chemistry, um, you know, a lot of collaborations with experts in that kind of physics lower energy physics in order to understand your backgrounds is becoming more and more crucial as we search for um, particles at lower mass. So one of the targets I've gotten super interested in is superfluid helium. Um, so helium is a bit special among the noble gases in that um, when it goes down, when you cool it, it stays liquid all the way down to zero Kelvin, absolute zero. It stays a liquid unless you pressurize it. And this is uh, below 2.2 you know, Kelvin, helium is a superfluid, um, which means it can move without viscosity, which is really a, just an amazing property of liquid helium at that temperature. Um, superfluid helium can also climb walls because it can you know, if you, and you can siphon it, suppose you have a cup of superfluid helium, because you can have a thin film of helium, it can actually siphon itself out of the cup. You can see this. It has zero viscosity, so it just climb the wall and go out the other side. Um, but superfluid helium also has, because it's a noble gas, it has similar ionization and scintillation properties as the heavier noble gases like xenon that we're very familiar with. And there's you know, quite a literature on understanding the electronic excitation properties of, of helium. But also it turns out because it's a superfluid, the excitations, the phonons, and there's another kind of excitation called a roton in superfluid helium. It turns out that they're very, very stable and can travel long distances through the superfluid helium without decaying or scattering. And those rotons and phonons can also carry information away from the initial particle track. And so in the short term, we're interested in looking at helium scintillation, as well as the heat that's produced, the phonons produced by individual particles, using the ratio of those two uh, in order to tell background from signal. Remember in the liquid xenon, we use the ratio of charge to prompt light to tell the difference between background and signal. In the helium, we think we can use the ratio of light to heat, light to photons or rotons, in order to tell the difference between background and signal. Um, in the longer term, we're hoping that things like the phonon-roton ratio, the ratio of these different kinds of fundamental excitations in the helium, might allow us to get particle identification at extremely low energies. Um, but uh, you know that remains to be seen, but we feel like helium detectors have a lot of promise in terms of background rejection and are also well scalable to large masses. When I started working on liquid xenon, you know, we had detectors at the 100 gram scale or kilogram scale, and then now we have ones at the 10 ton scale. Uh, so these detectors, as the technology is successful and endures and is scalable, then you can see how that can allow you to look for smaller and smaller dark matter interaction cross sections. And what's we hope the that similar to the helium if it's successful. So, so what's the temperature you write for xenon? 
Uh, xenon, we run at about 175 Kelvin. So roughly, you know, of order minus 100 degrees centigrade, roughly. Um, so it's balmy by cryogenic standards. <laughs> but, and uh, relatively straightforward cryogenics. Um, the hel superfluid helium, I mentioned it's superfluid below about 2.2 Kelvin. We actually plan to run it more like at 20 or 30 millikelvin. So 20 or 30 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. These are temperatures that you uh, can get to using something called a dilution refrigerator. Uh, pretty standard uh, piece of cryogenic hardware that can get you down to those temperatures. Uh, we want to roll those very low temperatures because the readout technique we plan to use using transition edge sensors, basically a strip of superconductor uh, 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 maintain at its transition point between superconducting and normal. Uh, you can run that so it's very, very sensitive to small amounts of heat. Turns out that technique that technique performs better and better the lower the temperature of the experiment. So we'd like to run the helium, for example, at temperatures you know, much closer to absolute zero just to get the best possible sensitivity. Right. Uh, so yeah, a lot of engineering challenges. Um, Looks promising. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are a lot of experiments going on. Uh, it make a fundamental difference in our understanding, right? So this is something, as you say, it's outside the standard model. Um, it will challenge everything that we sort of thought we knew <laughs> in some sense. Uh, and so, so in conclusion, uh, Daniel, so you, you have thought a lot about this. Uh, you are looking at sort of the sub-proton mass uh, arena um, just just below BIMS and so on. Uh, if you were to put your money, if you were a betting man, Daniel, uh, in the whole spectrum. <laughs> scientists, you know, unless there's a <laughs> unless there's a good angle and a way to make money, are not betting them. That's no, true. let me ask you differently. Uh, <laughs> uh, given everything that you know and and uh, looking at, what is sort of your probabilistic? expectation um, where, where there's the highest probability that we may find in terms of mass the ideal candidate for dark matter i don't know you know i uh i i don't you know i don't think it's a well-posed question actually <laughs> it's hard to you know i i uh i think you know every once in a while you get a scientist who um who's very certain that their theory is correct and that they will find the dark matter will be found at a particular cross section and mass. And, um, you know, I think that the parameter space for the dark matter is so wide open. Um, and so many different kinds of theoretical candidates that I don't even know how I would define such a probability. Actually. So I prefer to avoid it. I, I think, you know, we have many promising ways to search for the dark matter. Um, as particle experiments go, these are relatively inexpensive. Um, so it makes sense to have a, a range of different kinds of experiments to look at the different kinds of dark matter particles. Uh, many of these experiments are even just tabletop scale projects and not requiring a lot of people to, uh, to run and build and operate them. So it's, uh, in a way, it's like a, you know, small businesses, uh, many of them to uh, compete uh, for new particle physics, um, some of the larger experiments. I mean, the liquid xenon experiments are getting big enough that you know, it becomes a sort of a couple hundred person scale operation, which is larger than, much larger than most of these experiments. But by and large, if you look at the, the experiments that are being proposed and built, they tend to be pretty small and very innovative you know, technologically. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the techniques can also be uh, connected to new innovations in quantum computing. Uh, a lot of the, the, the quantum and low temperature readout um, has technical connections to that. And so and there are also, because we don't have time to talk about it, but uh, I, I, you should get a, a new guest to talk about the connections between quantum computing and quantum sensing and dark matter uh, actually, because that's uh, quite an interesting area uh, that's being developed right now. Yeah, I mean, a lot of lot of opportunities. I would imagine um, physics students getting into this area. It's wide open, right? Right. Um, lot of, I mean, lot of ideas. Um, 
a lot of opportunities for experimentation and theory, both. Absolutely. And it could make a fundamental difference. So, excellent. Yeah. Uh, this has been great, Daniel. Thanks so much for spending oh, time with me. Truly my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.